future group, the state-sponsored terrorism, if you will, uh, that was probably more prevalent, more popular in the 70s. But Iran, which of course we have now, the United States and its partners have made struck a, a deal over the nuclear, its nuclear weapons, nuclear arms program, uh, is now in the process of still being very active with its unconventional forces called the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Forces, Quds Force. And they are now a prominent feature on the ground in places like Syria. They have, they have elements in northern Yemen that are advising and equipping Houthi rebels there. So just because the Iranians have struck a deal with the United States on their nuclear program, they are still causing considerable amount of mischief uh, with their unconventional military. Uh, there's also here in the United States, there's the increasing concern that law enforcement have about home ground threats. That is the threat that we certainly saw in the Boston Marathon bomb a couple of years ago, and most recently in July of this year when a young gunman assaulted a naval training center in Chattanooga, killing five service members there. This is a serious problem that many of the people that terrorism officials fear, many of the Americans who are going abroad to fight in Syria and Iraq, may be coming back someday to carry out attacks here. That wasn't the case in Chattanooga. That individual was influenced strictly by what he was seeing on the internet. But the concern of US and other countries is that many of these fighters will come back with the skills they learned on the battlefields in the Mideast and carry out attacks here. And then finally, the last kind of bucket that we have to be concerned with is the increasing threat of cyber terrorism, of cyber attacks. And of course, this whole world is kind of in many ways open to many of us uh, through the disclosures that Edward Snowden, the former NSA contractor, revealed uh, when he identified a number of programs that involved the NSA eavesdropping on American citizens. Uh, but much of the information that he revealed also had to do with things like the United States eavesdropping on the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, on her, on her uh, cell phone. Uh, and in addition to whatever disclosures he's made, we now know that state-sponsored actors, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, are constantly, or groups affiliated, oftentimes criminal groups, are attacking our networks, both government networks and private industry networks, be it the banking industry, financial services, oil industry, these networks are coming under constant attack. So America is, real, is a real crossroads, I think, with its involvement now with these big land wars in the Middle East and Asia starting to finally you know, you know, diminish somewhat. Obviously, the US is still very much involved in Iraq and in, uh, and in Afghanistan. But, um, but after a, a, more than a decade of fighting big wars with more than 100,000 troops, uh, it's, it should now become a challenge on the part of American policymakers to figure out a new way ahead. Uh, but unlike the Al-Qaeda that the United States confronted on 9-11 in 2001, the threats today are much more decentralized and knitted together by an Islamic extremism that's definitely propagated over Twitter, Facebook, and other social media. They're pulling new recruits in, they're making, they're making their pitch in a global way that's much more sophisticated and, and, and much more scary, I think, for many law enforcement officials and how effective they are. So what are the tools that the US and its partners are working with to try and combat these various forms of terrorism? You have the various tactics, of course, we've talked about. You have military forces on the ground, special operations forces in many of these places, American troops helping local troops combat this threat. You also have the president talking about how you utilize a key weapon in this fight against terrorism. That weapon is the drone, the Predator drone, the Reaper drone. It's remote, remotely piloted vehicles armed with missiles that are carry out attacks against militants across the battlefield. And the president two years ago talked about trying to shift more of those drone attacks out of the hands of the CIA, which has been conducting many of them, particularly in Pakistan over the last several years, and into the hands of the military, where it was thought you'd have more transparency. We'd have a better understanding as the American public about what kind of attacks the United States was actually carrying out, bring some of these attacks that were, frankly, causing almost counter counterproductive impact in many of these countries, bring them into the light, hold them more accountable, having military carry them out rather than the CIA. That, unfortunately, has not happened. 
critics in Congress slowing that shift in the agency itself, the CIA that is, slowing that transfer process. We still have uh, a system in the United States government where the drone strikes are carried out roughly equally now between the military and the CIA itself. So what else is at the president's disposal? Well, he's clearly trying to figure out ways to counter the finances of these terrorist organizations. Money is the lifeblood of these terrorist organizations. Oftentimes, it's not sexy what they're doing, but uh, it's very important in trying to dry up their assets in foreign banks. In the case of the Islamic State, they have oil proceeds that they are able to get from the oil the territory they control. And so coming after those networks is very important. But perhaps most troubling and most difficult is going after the propaganda machine. And while Al-Qaeda was good, ISIS is even better in getting its message out, as I mentioned before, getting it out over a social media platform and, and tailoring it to different types of people in multiple languages. Not just English, but pretty much every language you can, you can think of where they might reach out to people disaffected with where they're living, where their situation is life is, come be a part of something new here at the college. But this is still largely a foreign policy while it has these different players in it, the State Department, the Pentagon, the Treasury Department. It's still a foreign policy today that's largely driven from the White House, probably more so than any other time in my 25 years of covering Washington politics and policy, where even as we approach the end of President Obama's second term, he still maintains a very tight hold on that policy. And while he certainly wants to hear from his advisors in various departments, it, it gets necked down very quickly to a very small number of top advisors that he relies on right there in the White House. It's tightly controlled. And as we look at the end of this president's term in office, we're looking at how he is very clearly trying to stake out a legacy for himself, not just on the domestic side, clearly the health care program that he has been pushing through, but on the, on the, uh, on the foreign policy, the national security side. And just this year, he's had some pretty significant victories. The restoration of relations with Cuba, the deal, the deal I mentioned in the Iranian, Iranian nuclear program, seminal victories that overcame a lot of opposition, both here at home and, and Abroad. But the one thing that continues to dog him are these overseas wars. Of course, he started as a president and campaigned on ending the war in Iraq, at least the U.S. combat role in Iraq. And certainly, his goal was to do so uh, with that campaign and with the campaign in Afghanistan by the time he was on this. Now, it's very clear, I think, that just won't happen. There will be American boots on the ground in some capacity in both of those countries by the time he leaves. He turns it over to a President Trump, a President Carson, and maybe even President Clinton. You see the lines there. So let me go back over those buckets and just unpack a little bit more so we can understand where this threat is coming from <coughs> in each one of these. And, and I go to Afghanistan first because, again, that's the traditional threat, the Al-Qaeda threat that started there. That's where bin Laden, of course, was on the original 9-11. And we look at what's going on, the, the, the big debate in Washington over the last several months is how low would the president go in terms of his troop, the troop numbers of troops that he would keep inside of Afghanistan at the end of this year. Originally, it was going to be roughly 10,000, so the year it started, he was going to draw down almost to zero, maybe a few hundred in the embassy there. And yet, over the last several months, many of his different advisors have weighed in for different reasons on why it was important to keep the troop levels at least where they are for at least another year. The Pentagon wanted to keep troops in the field longer because they felt the Afghans that they were training and basically transferring those skills still needed more practice. They still needed to be there helping them combat a resurgent Taliban and now it looks like a resurgent ISIS as well inside of Afghanistan. The State Department wanted to support its new the new leader in Afghanistan. Hamid Karzai, after many years and a very contentious relationship with Washington, is out, and a technocrat in Ashraf Ghani is in. He's proved to be a much more reliable, dependable partner inside of Afghanistan, working in the United States. The United States wants to help him out, but it's Afghanistan. It's a very difficult place to get anything done, and with all the pressures he's facing, that is President Ghani, the leader in Afghanistan, he needs all the help he can get. 
least that's the view of the State Department. So another reason to have more, have that American presence, that security blanket, if you will, not going higher than the troop level now, just not drawing down as fast. And then interestingly enough, the CIA is very interesting. You won't ever hear that. They won't ever come out and publicly say that, of course, because they have covert operations that are based in Afghanistan. They're still carrying out missions inside of Pakistan against Al Qaeda. They're still flying those drones I talked about earlier. If the United States military draws down, there goes the CIA security, and they have to pull out their mission as well. And there goes the bulk of the counterterrorism mission that still arguably needs to be fought in that part of the world. is diminished, as I mentioned it was. Al Qaeda is still a serious threat. They can never reconstitute, never gin back up again. They are still gunning the United States. So interestingly, you have the Pentagon, the State Department, the CIA, all weighing in with the president. And over time, I think that made a difference. I think also watching the situation in, in Iraq unfold as it has. Because of course in Iraq, we did just the opposite. The United States drew down completely at the end of 2011, pretty much handed it over to the government, the prime, the Prime Minister Maliki at the time, and things over those next couple of years unraveled to the place where we are today. The U.S. didn't have the kind of presence on the ground there, or it had the eyes and ears that might have detected that threat growing and then could have alerted people in a, in a louder way. It, it didn't have that moderating influence on Prime Minister Maliki as Shia as he started to kind of replace many of the more competent Sunni commanders in the north and other places so that when ISIS did come, there was virtually no allegiance uh, to the government in Baghdad. <coughs> so what will happen now as we, as we move forward here? The U.S. is still trying to back this Afghan threat, back the Afghans against the Taliban threat, but the Taliban is resurgent. And what to do about the rise of ISIS? This will be the challenge for this president over the next several months as he finishes goes into his final full year of office. So that's kind of drilling down a little bit on that first threat, where things are going as we watch, uh, and watch kind of where the president has made some new decisions. The second is the one that's grabbing most of the headlines today, and that is this rise of ISIS in the Islamic State, which actually was initially a branch of Al-Qaeda. It used to be called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It was pretty much beaten down, the so-called surge led by General David Petraeus in 2007. And when the U.S. left Iraq in 2011, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was still present, but it was something we felt you know, the Iraqi security forces could handle on their own, with a little bit of American help from time to time. It didn't work out that way. The threat grew. The Iraqis took their eye off that threat. The Americans took their eye off that threat. Remember, President Obama is trying to close that book. He wants to close that Iraq chapter on his legacy and turn to other things. Give it to Asia, maybe, dealing with Russia. Obviously, lots of other problems I mentioned at the beginning. That problem festered. The Al-Qaeda branch expanded over into Syria. It teamed up with many of Saddam Hussein's former generals, the Ba'athists, who had fled after the first, after the, uh, after the Iraq war. And you had this kind of unholy alliance of Islamic militants, the ideologues, married up with some of these old Ba'athist generals and they created this hybrid terrorist army, if you will, called the Islamic State, with the sole objective to take territory now. They were all followers of Osama bin Laden, but Bin Laden said, we're not there yet, guys. We need to you know, work this thing out. It may take a few generations before we're ready to create this caliphate. And the new leader of the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdad is his name, he said, no, no, we're ready now. We can do this. We have God behind us. That's his interpretation, of course, the corrupt interpretation of Islam. But he had something that Al-Qaeda didn't. He had, a, he had that, those Ba'athist generals behind him. And they could go back and forth. They could be terrorist insurgents in one moment if they needed to be. They could be almost like a full-blown army when they had to be as well. And that's what happened a little over a year ago when they rolled into northern Iraq. They used that military capability those Iraq, former Iraqi generals, and they just pushed to basically make the gates of Baghdad. They came very close to coming right into the Iraqi capital before the Shia militia that surrounded the capital and protected the regime were able to fend them off, basically where we are today. But this is a much more dangerous organization than Al-Qaeda, in my mind, because of that. It's this hybrid nature of it. 
and the fact that they control territory and they can derive wealth from that territory. They aren't, they aren't reliant on donations from, from Saudi princes or anybody else in the Gulf, they saw the Saudi highlands. They get about half a billion dollars a year from oil proceeds from the oil fields in eastern Syria. They get about another half a billion dollars from the taxes and fees and kidnapping ransoms that they collect from the people who live in that territory and that straddle that eastern part of Syria and the western and northern part of Iraq. And until the U.S. and this coalition can shrink that space, push them out of that space, probably first in Iraq, but also increasingly looking perhaps in Syria, they are going to be a major force because they're going to have that revenue that comes in that helps pay for their fighters, that helps them stand up to the international coalition and basically saying, look at us. We are defying the world. We're staking out our claims, and yeah, we, maybe we've lost a little bit around the edges, but we're still here more than a year later, despite the air campaign the U.S. and all its allies have thrown against us. Come join us. Come join us. And their appeal is interesting because they appeal to more than one group. Al-Qaeda was pretty much aiming for the young, radical male who was in for the violence, that 18 to 32-year-old male from the Middle East, from Europe, from North Africa. And ISIS wants those guys too. That's why you see these gruesome beheading videos. It's, it's this warped sense that they'll, they'll act, that'll actually attract these violent seekers. These people want to get on the ground, get on the ground and fight. They want to fight the West. They want to fight apostate regimes in the Middle East. But ISIS is smarter than that because they appeal to at least two other groups. They appeal, and again, this is in multiple languages, they appeal to young couples and children in the suburbs around Paris, the Muslim couples in Families around Paris who feel totally alienated from French society, the way the structure is in that, in that culture. And they're appealing to them almost as homesteaders. Come be a part of something brand new, something that is true to your faith as Muslims. This is, again, the line, this is the propaganda line that's going on. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing young families of children picking up and heading to Syria and Iraq, despite the violence and despite the risks to their safety, because they want to be a part of something. Their, their lives they feel have no meaning where they are now, but they'll find this meaning in the caliphate, and that's where they're going. The other group that ISIS is reaching out to pretty effectively so far are professionals. If you need a state, you need to have, you need to have people who not run a state. You need police chiefs, you need engineers, you need doctors. And so ISIS is doing that, and they're advertising signing bonuses, just like corporations with going out and attracting and trying to steal talent from their rivals. That's what they're doing here. Obviously, these people are going to put up with a certain amount of risk to go. But again, they're drawing them in as well, because they want to make this state work. Unclear for doing so. Because even as ISIS, as I mentioned before, one of the tools that it has, besides these grisly, you know, threatening tools, beheading and intimidation that they have, they're also using un unconventional weapons. They're holding back water. They're, again, holding on, they control the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in, in Syria and Iraq. They are holding some key dams, places like Mosul. And so they're able to, therefore, regulate the flow of water that comes in and out of that. And for areas that they are trying to punish, or areas that are their enemies, they can de deny water. They're increasing their ports of that. It's not a perfect solution that they have by any means. They're increasing reports from within, uh, the Islamic State from some of the people that are filtering out, their electricity shortages in some of the major cities there. So even as they try and use these unusual weapons of food and water in, in, in an unconventional way, uh, they're, they're grappling with how do you deal with this? How do you, how do you make a new society work when the whole world is coming down on you, literally with bombs every day in Syria and Iraq and trying to push in around you? This group has right now probably over 30,000 fighters from all over the world. And they're coming in at roughly a rate of 1,000 a month. Those are the fighters that are being trafficked, again, largely through these social media. Even though the military says they're killing almost as many in their bombing campaigns and some of the ground operations that they're carrying out, they're still, ISIS is still able to keep a fresh wave of generated fighters and doing that. And not only that, but as they stand up to the West, they stand up and fight because they make their claims increasingly in a bold way on social media. They see 
other groups around the world popping up, other militant groups wanting to join the fight. And so you now have at least eight or nine different extremist groups who basically raised the black flag of ISIS and said, we're with you. From that group, Boko Haram in Nigeria that I talked about, to a couple of groups in Libya, which right now is in free fall with no central government. It's a perfect breeding ground for these kind of extremists. To Yemen, to the Sinai, Egyptian forces are having a battle with all the way up into Afghanistan. So these are, in some cases, existing indigenous groups that just see an opportunistic time right now to say, oh, ISIS is the hot thing. I'm going to join the bandwagon. If I call myself ISIS and I get recognized, people may be more scared of me. I'm just a local group. That's part of it. But part of it is this feeling that ISIS has, that you're all part of a much larger global network. And they've lowered the standards for enrollment. Al-Qaeda used to be very picky about who they let in the club, some of these other affiliates that they have. Not ISIS. They're basically taking most anybody. You want to you get up on YouTube and make a video and talk, call yourself ISIS? Great. If they're just repeating the mantra that they're the ones that are in charge. So this is really um, one of the major threats, I think, facing the United States today. And John Brennan, the CIA director, uh, voiced such earlier concerns this year over this. And what he talked about was an emergence of a terrorist threat that is increasingly decentralized, difficult to track, and even more difficult to thwart. And that is, again, the kind of campaign that we're facing today. Drilling down to the third bucket, going back to the Iranians. And again, on the one side, you got to think about having to deal with one part of the Iranian government that negotiated the nuclear deal. There's a whole other point whole parallel structure, security structure, inside of the inside of Iran. They all report up to the Supreme Leader. But this other group, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, it's counterterrorism kind of corps, it's, it's an exterior force, a Quds force, they are involved in all sorts of things. They're basically a parallel military security service structure. And they are involved in ground fight in Syria, in Iraq, They've got advisors in the northern part of Yemen, as I mentioned before. They can be a very destabilizing fun factor in many of these countries. And in places like Iraq, which is an ally, and Syria, which is not, they're basically a key part of keeping that government power. It's one of the main tensions right now as we face and that you have, oddly enough, on the same battlefield, you have American Special Forces advisors basically in some command rooms. And in other command rooms right nearby, you have Iranian advisors, all advising the same Iraqi troops. How do you, how do you square that? And the United States says, we don't. We don't deal directly with the Iranians. We all go through the Iraqis. But it's a very, very tricky operation, as we see now. And then you go to Syria, and we're on the other side of the Iranians. They're backing Bashar al-Assad, who, of course, the United States and President Obama said it has to go at some point. Hopefully not right away, immediately, that would cause an implosion. But it shows, again, you kind of look at this foreign policy and say, how can this be? And you want one country we're with the Iranians, and one country, one country we're not, and yes, we just struck this deal with them. Welcome to foreign policy in Washington. It's confusing, it really is. This is on the international side. I want to come back to that homegrown threat, that threat from Chattanooga that I mentioned before. Because this one is tough enough as it is to crack on the international side. The homeland threat, the threat here in the United States, may be even more difficult. And thankfully, the threat here can go all the way back in the last 20 years, of course, going back to Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma City, uh, the attack on Fort Hood by the Army officer there, uh, and then most recently, of course, uh, the two brothers, the Sarnaya brothers, the Boston Marathon, uh, and this, this chat in the Chattanooga Gun. You're dealing increasingly with individuals who are carrying out these attacks. Go back and think to that day, that fateful day in 2001, the plotters of the 9 11 attack were a cell, they were a group of people. Anyone, anyone which had been detected could have unraveled the whole plot. And that's one of the main reasons why we haven't seen a, a plot of that scale succeed against the United States since then. Obviously, we're on to them now. We're looking for that. But we're also looking for any kind of tripwire, any individual who might, if you were to detect them and pull the string, you're going to find this whole web built around them. Well, if you're an individual sitting in your basement 
watching some ISIS video in English all by yourself, who's to know if you're going to pick up an automatic weapon and go take it into the streets? Who's to know? That's what happened in Chattanooga in July. This young man who killed the five service members there, when they went back and they went through his, his computer, they basically found in the days leading up to the attack, he was looking up uh, Islamic materials about whether martyrdom would lead to forgiveness for his sins. In this part, for his part, it was like drunkenness and financial debt. And these searches that they were able to do on his computer, you know, were able to put together a very detailed portrait of this 24-year-old 24, 24 man. His name is Muhammad Abdul Aziz. And basically, they were able to kind of patch together going through his computer, his hard drives, other online and communication interviews with his family to figure out, you know, what was it that motivated this guy? And in many ways, they still don't have a very clear answer. They know he was very angry, he was despondent in many ways, and that while he wasn't responding in any specific direction from a terrorist group, he clearly had this churning in his mind. And this, was, this is what worries people from the FBI and the police departments around the country. Because as hard as it is to try and detect a cell that's about to carry out a plot, it's almost impossible to kind of watch everybody who might be thinking about doing something like this. And the FBI is monitoring plenty of these people. They've got people that can go in and they watch them on the chat rooms, they watch them online, but they can't watch everybody. There are literally hundreds of possible suspects. You know, some of these people are just dabbling in these sites. Who's to know which is the person, which is the man, or the woman, increasingly, who's going to decide to take the next step, who's decided to make a bomb, a homemade bomb, the recipe of which you can find online very easily. Pick up a gun, which you can obviously buy, and take it into a shopping center. Go down to a middle group recruiting station, go into a suburb and carry out an attack. That's what ISIS is telling people to do now. They're not into the big, large-scale attack that Al-Qaeda was all about, the big, glorious, you know, take down buildings and aircraft bombs. They're in for one by one, taking out Westerners and Americans, however their adherents and followers can. That's how they feel they will succeed, and it's the toughest fight to be. Finally, you layer in, you go from that small homegrown threat to the newest technological threat, and that's from cyber. As I mentioned before, the threat's coming from Snowden. Uh, we can debate you know, whether Snowden is a traitor, in you know, many, many uh, circles, certainly in the right, right in the reporting in Washington, or as a whistleblower, as somebody who came out and rightfully exposed what many people feel were illegal programs carried out by the NSA, despite the fact that they were approved by Congress and courts. It wasn't something most Americans knew. Their, uh, their, kind of, their, their telephone calls would be, would be logged and could not work. So this, this kind of thing has opened up a whole new world in watching the kind of cyber attacks that this country is under every single day, whether it's the United States government, the Pentagon itself gets hundreds of hits every day from unknown sources we suspect most of them are coming from China, Russia, and Iran, with many to be criminal networks. And this is true now, too, of many of our financial firms. And with our cyber, so much of our, course, our commerce, our everyday lives right now have to do with the internet and cyber. But this is one of our great vulnerabilities that's now being challenged by our adversaries. So now that I've kind of painted that rosy picture, what, what do we do? How do you confront this? How do you deal with this? Uh, I kind of sketched out a little bit how this administration and the Bush administration before it has, has tried to do this. And one thing that we talk about in, in the book that my colleague Tom Shanker and I wrote called Counter-Strike is that it clearly has to be a whole of government effort. It can't just be the military. It can't just be the CIA. It's, it's all of those government agencies and more. The Treasury Department, for instance, taking the lead role in taking out the finances of the terrorist organization. And it can't just be the United States, because as we've seen of all these terrorist organizations, they're transnational. They cross boundaries. There are no boundaries. There is no boundary anymore. There's no border anymore between Syria and Iraq when you're in ISIL land. It's all just ISIL territory now. So we can't think that we in the United States can deal with this problem on our own. And that's why you've seen, starting with President Bush, following on with President Obama, international coalitions that have formed 
both for the military and intelligence capabilities they bring, but also to show unity of effort. Even small countries, every, every little part that they can do is very important. So this fight is going to go on for years and years, I'm afraid, just because of the nature of terrorism. I think we thought there was a point after the United States left in Iraq in 2011, uh, my editors were coming to me and said, maybe Schmidt, maybe we should put you on a new beat. It's like terrorism going to be the kind of passe. It's going to be a thing of the past. I said, I don't know. Let's kind of wait a little while on that one before you switch me over to a movie critic or a home section or something like that. And sure enough, because every, every time this has happened in our history, I think we let our guard down, we let our focus off, and somebody else pops up again. Terrorism, properly managed, is going to be like crime. It's going to be like drugs. It's always going to be out there. It's just going to be have to be kept at a local level. What's happened here is we take our eye off the ball, and it branches into a transnational threat. It requires a transnational solution. One of the... Uh, so there's these kind of multiple branches that we have to take into account. And I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about something else we discovered in the process of writing our book. And that was, there's another way kind of layered on to these various approaches in how you combat terrorism, whether it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or any of these other groups that are sprouting up around <coughs> the world today. And it's the whole idea of how you might be able to deter, deter terrorist attacks and deter terrorists. And what we found in our research in the book was in the mid-2000s in the Pentagon, when Don Rumsfeld was still there, there was a group, small group of policymakers and academics who were trying to think of a new way, a new way ahead, a counterintuitive way, perhaps, of how you battle, this time it was Al-Qaeda, of course. ISIS wasn't on the scene yet. And what they went back and they decided was there was a way, they found, that you might be able to deter terrorist attacks, perhaps eliminate them altogether, at least push them off. And they went around and they tried to shop this theory to their colleagues inside the Defense Department the State Defense. And they were initially met with great skepticism. And, and why is that? Well, most of the people there were saying, wait a minute, wait a minute here. The, the original concept of deterrence, as we understand it, we remember it was that approach that basically safeguarded the world against a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. With the basic notion that the United States knew the exact coordinates of physical things inside the Soviet Union. Kremlin, Soviet military bases, the dachas that the Politburo members kept from their ballerina mistresses. There were physical things you could target with weapons, with nuclear weapons if you had to. And the Soviets had the same for the United States. And that, basically kept everything in balance. You know? And so the critics were saying, well, wait a minute, Al-Qaeda is, we just talked about it, is a transnational threat here. It doesn't have a headquarters down at the corner of the Main Street here that you can target in Londo, even if after Bin Laden was killed. How is it that you can apply this theory? But here's what these guys learned. Here was kind of the, the intuitive scoop that they had. It's the idea that, well, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations may not necessarily have physical things they value. They have other types of spiritual values. For Al-Qaeda, many of these guys, it was part of being the respect they would have from within inside the Muslim community, the Ummah. How would they be viewed among their peers? That was very, very important. And so it was figuring out what was important to these guys and how to exploit them, how to throw them off their game. And so what we found as we did our research, were some pretty interesting examples of how they were able to do that over time. And the one I like to tell most is about a militant leader in southern Afghanistan, a guy named Ahmed. And Ahmed was a pretty, pretty savvy operator. He was carrying out attacks against US forces and against Afghan forces with small explosives called IEDs, with raids, with ambushes. They were, they were mounting up some pretty serious casualties. So the Americans came up with what they thought was a pretty cool American solution. Let's put out a reward for this guy. Well, the problem with that in this culture, in this time was that half the people were scared to death of him. They didn't want to touch the support. The other half were silently supporting 
because they opposed this American invasion of the country. And they, they looked at Ahmed almost like a Robin Hood type figure, standing up to this big American bully. Well, Ahmed's forces continued to carry out their attacks. The IEP attacks increased, the attacks and ambushes on American forces increased, the number of casualties continued to rise, and commanders were you know, getting pretty upset about what was going on. They had to come up with a different solution. So some of the guys on this team in Afghanistan, the Americans, working with their Afghan colleagues, said, you know what, we've been hearing about this new theory that's being developed by some smart people back in Washington. Let's try something new with this character of them. Instead of increasing the bounty on his head, we're going to lower the bounty on his head. And we're going to send our Afghan surrogates out into the market, and we're going to say, yeah, you know, Ahmed, he's just not worth it anymore. You know why? Because did you ever even see him anymore? He's in hiding. Of course, Ahmed is in hiding. He's good operational security to stay home. The word got spread that Ahmed, he's not making his payroll. He's not paying his fighters. We think he's really lost a little bit as a really, you know, as an ace militant fighter. I think you better think about going to somebody else now, trading in and shopping your, shopping your terrorist wear or something else. Well, as the word spreads, propaganda campaign against Ahmed spread. You can imagine, you heard about it. Eventually, there's a little Heidi folks in Ahmed, and he was pissed off. How could the Americans challenge him as this great terrorist leader when he's carrying out day after day of attacks? But just to be sure, he got up on his cell phone and starts calling all his lieutenants just to make sure they hadn't really defected. That's exactly what the Americans wanted. Because one thing that's happened, very important thing that's happened over 10 plus years of these wars, the United States has been able to build a tremendous technological advantage in basically scooping up any kind of electronic communication, be it over the internet, be it over cell phones, scoop it up, geolocate it, triangulate where that is, and swoop down. And that's what they did to Akbar. Not only did they go in and capture him, but they went and rounded up the six or seven other lieutenants of his that he had called on his phone. Boom, down goes Ahmed, down go the attacks. Very non-traditional, how you think about that. But it was the way the US military in Afghanistan and parts of Iraq were able to crack many of these networks, many of these terrorist groups. Think of them as a network, identify the weak link, identify the vulnerability inside of them, and go after it. Pretty soon the, link, the links start to fall apart. And at worst, you're going you're gonna to delay that attack. At best, you're going to take it off the battlefield altogether, as we did with Ahmed's set. As optimistic as that may be, it's just one part. Obviously, because this enemy is going to be very adaptive. Al Qaeda proved adaptive. ISIS is even more so. And so, one of the other things that we conclude in our book is we have to expect that we, the United States, will be hit again by another major terrorist attack. We got off pretty lucky in the Boston Marathon bombing, frankly. As tragic as it was, three people killed over 260 million. It could have been a lot worse. And it may well be, given the nature of this fight, as you still have elements of Al-Qaeda trying to blow up airplanes. You now have ISIS spreading the word, take up arms wherever you are, and this homegrown threat that's amongst us at the moment. So I think one of the things we have to do as a government, to do as a people, and I don't think that our government has done as good a job as it could, is instilling a sense of resilience in the public. And I don't mean physical resilience. The ability to rebuild at ground zero. If you go to Manhattan, you see what I mean. Rebuild that tower, uh, you know, to basically say we're not going to stand for this anymore. I'm talking about the kind of psychological resilience that the Israelis have, Europeans have, that other countries that have gone through waves of domestic terrorism in their history have, where when they get hit, they don't give in. They don't overreact either. They clean up, they mourn their dead, and they move on. They don't overreact, because that's exactly what the terrorists they want. They want an overreaction. They want the American government to send tens of thousands of troops back into the battlefields of the Middle East and South Asia. That's just going to be great fodder for their propaganda and will inspire a whole new generation of fighters to come out of, out of the war, to come up against the fight of the West in this, this never-ending cycle of violence. It's very difficult, though, as a politician these days to kind of make that argument, to save the American public, despite everything we're doing, despite the billions of dollars we're spending on defenses, 
and offensive measures to try and keep these fighters at bay, we still may come under attack. Because for the US to succeed, it has to defeat each and every plot that comes up. For the terrorist group, for Al Qaeda or ISIS, they only have to be successful every once in a while. And they can claim that great success. Even the failures they have, they can say to their followers, look how close we got. Look how close we got on Christmas Eve of 2009 to blowing up a jetliner over Detroit. If that had happened, it would have been a seminal event in this presidency. Whole ten changed everything. Changed everything. It came that close that day to having a very different kind of America after that. And so this is the challenge going forward as we face this large array of threats, both externally driven and increasingly internally motivated. It's how to combat these. How to think smartly about working for themselves inside the government and it goes all the way down to the local level, local law enforcement, local groups that can spot these kind of things, all the way up to the global scene and working with partners. Oftentimes, odd bell bed bedfellows, whether it be working with the Russians in one place but not the other, the Iranians in one place but not the other. We have to get used to these kind of un unusual partnerships in, in order to move ahead in combating these terrorist threats. I want to thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.